the book of John, if you will, this morning. We're going to continue looking at the Gospels and us. Uh, John, John chapter number 1. And uh, this wonderful Gospel here of John is something that is, uh, it, it's a tremendous book. And, and it's a book here that's going to depict the Lord Jesus Christ and His earthly ministry as who He ultimately is, and that is the Son of God. And as we come to John... Again, John is generally uh, separated away from the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason for that is because they don't know how to handle it. When you look at John, they go, oh, we can't make them harmonize. We can't make them uh, sync up. We can't do this. And that's, you know, there's only eight miracles in John. You know, the other books have more. There's only certain things in John that that are in the other books. And literally, when you come to John, again, you see him, you see Matthew, he's the king, Mark, he's the servant, Luke, he's the man, and now John, he's God. And it's critical to catch what's going on in John because usually, again, the church at large out there, they say, if you get saved, read the book of John. I would tell you, read Romans, okay? (laughs) Go where you're supposed to go, don't, because really John, John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, he's not even, he's in the upper room with the the 12, the 11 apostles. John is very Jewish book. He's never talking to a Gentile uh, in in John. He never deals with, and yet people say what? Go read John. So there's 21 chapters, 879 verses. 19,099 words. So it's a little bit bigger book. And again here, I, what John's going to tell us is that Jesus is the great I am. He's the Jehovah. And uh, again, he, we're going to see as we go through this week and next, we're going to see, behold your God. John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's where we are going to start in the book, the gospel of John. Now, John, by the way, John is going to depict the Lord Jesus Christ as God, but then also as king, servant, and man. John's going to pick up while Matthew presents the Lord as king dispensationally. Matthew's a transition book The law and the prophets were till John, John the Baptist, and then the preaching of the kingdom and every man's pressing into that. So there's a transition within Israel's own program, a dispensational change, a marker. And that's the whole thing about right division, that I I guarantee you Christianity as a whole has no understanding of it. What right division, when you understand your Bible rightly divided or dispensationally consider it, What you're doing is you're recognizing the marks, the cuts that the Lord has already put in the book. He's already, God the Father has already made marks through the book. And what we do is just come up and say, okay, that's that, that's that, this is that, this is us, this is it. And that's all you're doing. You're rightly dividing the word of truth. You're taking truth and dividing truth. You're not taking truth and dividing it from error. See? You're just taking truth and you're saying, okay, this truth, is it true in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God? Yes, it is true. But then he says the same was in the beginning with God. So you've got this this movement. So just as Matthew presents the Lord as king dispensationally, John's going to present him as king doctrinally. This is who he is. Who is he? He's the Messiah. Again, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. By the way, the Word, you see the capital W, that is his name. Go back with me to 1 John chapter number 5. You have to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ, that name, Lord, Jehovah, Jesus, his humanity, Christ, the Messiah, that, those names come later in his, in his life. As Jesus Christ, the Gabriel tells Mary, you're going to call his name Jesus. There's his humanity. See, he, he wasn't Jesus back here. What is he back here in, in time past, in eternity past? He's the Word. 1 John 5, look at verse 7. 
For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Who's in heaven? We always say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. By the way, that formula is, is not a formula to live by, I'll be honest with you, because Paul changes it. He, he, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, No. That comes out of one verse out of Matthew 28. And he's not talking to you or I. He's talking to Israel in the millennial kingdom. My point is in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, about the king, look down, go back to John 1. Look at John 1, and look over at verse 41. John 1, 41. So in John 1, you've got John the Baptist here, and you've got some disciples of John the Baptist who John has been out ministering and doing. They've come to understand John's baptism. They've come to understand what's going on and transpiring. And then they come, verse 41. Uh, well, verse 40, one of the two which heard John speak, followed him, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. What is Andrew? Here's John. Now, John just baptized the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. And Andrew hears John, sees that happen, and says what? goes back to Peter and says, Pete, we found the Messiah. We found Christ. So then they go and they have an interaction with him in verse 42, 43, 44, 45, 46. Nathanael shows up, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. So now you got Nathanael. Now look at what Nathanael says in verse 49. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the king of Israel. He doesn't say you're the Messiah. He says what? Doctrinally, who are you? You're the king. Come over to chapter 4. Chapter 4. By the way, you'll notice on the handout in the overhead, I kept everything in John. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, so we weren't doing a lot of running around. We're just in John. Look at John 4. So we're going to be all over John. All right? John 4. Look at verse 25. John 4:25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Drop down to verse 29. Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Verse 42. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is. I'm sorry, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Notice, they found the Messiah. Who did they find? They found the King of Israel. And John's going to have that. Come over to chapter 13. Chapter 13. Just as Mark paints the picture of the Lord as, Behold thy servant, and the servant issues, and Mark is a boom, boom, boom book, John picks up on that in John 13. If you look at verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, that's the little flock, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father giveth all things unto his hand, that he was come from God and went, to, to God, he, rise, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girdled himself. And he, uh, after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to do what? Wash the disciples' feet. The servant issue, verse 16. Verily, verily, I say unto you. By the way, verily, verily. All through John, verily, verily. You know what that is? That's a pay attention, dummy. You need to listen. Pay attention. Why? It's serious. Paul, in, in Galatians 1, he repeats himself, right? Verse 8, 9, repeat. Why? You better pay attention. In, first, in 2 Tim, Timothy, or Paul says, the Spirit speaketh expressly. You better pay attention to those kind of things. Here, verily, verily, verse 16, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Talking about John the Baptist. Again, what he demonstrates the true service. John doesn't miss this area. 
He doesn't allow it to slide by. What does he say? The Son of God, the Word, who is he? He's the King of the Jews, but also what is he? He's your servant. And he teaches them. Come back to chapter 4. By the way, 13 starts the upper room passage where he's going to educate the 12, but ultimately just the 11, on their jobs as the leadership group, as the governmental structure of the kingdom and what they're to do. Matthew 4, I'm sorry, John 4. If I say any other book, we're in John, okay? John 4, look at verse 6. John 4, verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey. Isn't that interesting? Isaiah 40 says that God does not get weary. But what is Jesus there? He's a man. In his humanity, what did he do? He got worn out. Sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. What? He's tired. He's thirsty. He's what? He's man. He's gonna, he calls him Jesus of Nazareth and the Son of Man. And then ultimately, the Son of God. Come over to chapter 11. Do you guys know the shortest verse in the Bible? Chapter 11, verse 35, right? Jesus wept. Why is God weeping? It isn't God as God. It's as what? As man. So John says, yes, he is king, servant, and man, but he is also God. And that's key. So in the book of John, we have no genealogy. Why? Because God has always been. He's everlasting to everlasting. There's no temptation. Why? Because God cannot be tempted. Come over to chapter 17 of John. No, all right? There's no uh, mount of transfiguration. Why? Because the mount of transfiguration was used to glorify his humanity as king and as man. There's no, there's no garden prayers, by the way. I told you 17, look over at 18. 18.1. When Jesus spoke these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook uh, Chedron, where, uh, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, and then you've got Judas and verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus saith unto them, I am he and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And he says, I am he, I am he, you know, down 6, 7, and 8. You see, there's no garden prayers there. In 1, verse 1, we're going into the garden. In verse 2, the betrayer shows up with the soldiers and from the religious leaders. There's no garden prayers there. There's not. Why? Because he's God. But if you look at chapter 17, verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son and thy son also, that, uh, that thy son also may glorify thee. Drop down to verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, there's... The only one of the few times in John, if not the only time, where you see the Lord pray. And as the Son of God, who's he talking to? The Father, his Father. It's very, and it's, and it's all about glorying. And you know what? Only he can do some things here. See? And there's that. So go back to chapter 1. So when you come to the, to the book of John, you really come to a, 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 a book where you're going to get a capsule of everything. And, and in reality, you're going to get a capsule of who the Lord really is. Who is he? He is the Son of God. So in John, the theme of John, okay, is John 1, verse 11 and 12 and 13. But really it's 11 and 12. John 1.11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were not born, I'm sorry, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And there's your born again issue that's going to come. Why? Because the nation of Israel, he came unto his own. Who's that? Israel. But Israel didn't receive him. Why? They're an apostasy. They're sons of Adam. They're sinners. And they miss their Redeemer. They miss their Savior. See, he came unto his own. And his own received him not. So John begins with the theme here in verse, there's going to be a group to do, but as many as do receive him, what did he do to them? He's going to give them the power, the new covenant power, the power to become. Why? Because they're, they understand they're sinners. They understand they need a Savior. They understand they need a Messiah. They know that he is the Messiah. They have believed in him. See as Messiah. That's what they're believing in, by the way. They don't believe that he died on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day. That's not in any of the pages here, by the way. You go there to John 3.16 and everybody loves, falls in love with John. John 3.16 is not the gospel. It's not. There's not a drop of blood in that verse. Now, Christianity reads it in, but it, when you read it, it's not there. By the way, they believe in him being what? the Son of God. They believe Him as Jesus of Nazareth. There's a name, see. So when you look here, He came unto His own. John recognizes that Israel is not going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And the whole book is written with this key factor in mind. Just watch. Go to chapter 2. Chapter 2. And look at verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Who's Passover? Isn't that interesting, the Jews? It's Israel's Passover. You're not there. You're not, you're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. Well, I got Jewish. No, you're a Gentile. Acts 7 declared you so. Come over to chapter 5. Chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Chapter 6, verse 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Why would you, three times a year, Moses tells Israel, three times a year you're going to go to Jerusalem. Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. But what I want you to catch is notice it's not the Lord's Passover. It's who? The Jews. Why? Because what did Israel have Israel done with those feast schedule? They've polluted it with a vain religious system. They've come in and they've torn it down. Come over to chapter 8. Chapter 8 and verse 47. Chapter 8, verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Man, what an indictment. He's already told them, for if ye had believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. He, Abraham talks of me. Moses writes about me. You guys are not receiving. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. John recognizes that the Jewish nature of the Lord's ministry as, and Israel's failure to recognize him as their Messiah. But then in, in one twelve he says, but, isn't that interesting? As many as received him. That's wonderful. Some do receive him. You see, there was a believing remnant in the nation. And John is literally writing to that believing remnant. Matthew, Mark, and Luke is writing to the nation as a whole to get them to understand and to recognize who Jesus Christ, who Jesus of Nazareth is. John says, you got those? Now here's to you guys. 
Here's what's coming your way. If you look there in chapter 1 in verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among what? Who? Us. Who's the us? The believing remnant. He came to his own, and his own did what? They didn't receive, but the Word came, and he lived with us. And notice verse 14, the parenthesis, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. We, who's the we? The believing remnant. Who beheld the glory of the Who understood who he really was? That believing remnant did. Verse 16. And of his fullness have all we received. And grace for grace. The believing remnant. The, those who heard him, believed what he said to be Messiah, watched him demonstrate it through the signs and the miracles. Again, preaching and showing. He preached the message of who he was and what he was going to be doing and how he was going to clean up Israel. And then he went and did it, and the believing remnant stood there and said, Yep, that's the Messiah. He's checkbox marking, he's marking every checkbox. There he is, and let's go. What did he do then? For as many as but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become. And that's what John is all about. John is going to, the real pulse of the book is that thing about becoming the sons of God. John's concerned about those who are going to be receiving the power to become sons of God. Now you think about the sons of God. That's a title for the angels in the, in, in the Old Testament. But it's also going to be a title for who in John 1? The believing remnant. In Romans 8, you and I are called what? Sons of God. Where are we going to reign? Heavenly places. See that? It starts with the sons of God, angelic realm, filling everything up. Then it moves to Adam, who should have been the son of. But he didn't. He sinned. Fall. Now the believing remnant on the earth, the sons of God, the believing, the believers, the church, the body of Christ, the sons of God. It's very fascinating. It's a wonderful study through your Bible, by the way, where you begin to, to draw that and to see it. The little flock, they're going to be the ones that are going to receive the power. Look, look there at verse 17, John 1, verse 17. This power. For the law was given by Moses. So what's that? The Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, right? The law. You do it or else. I'm going to nail you. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by who? By Jesus Christ. And you know what? Every Bible, everybody out there in my, the church today, they say, see, there's Paul's message, grace and truth. And that's not what he's talking about at all. What does God's grace say? He says, I did it for you. You couldn't do it. I did it for you. And the grace and truth, but grace and truth, see, he's making a reference now to the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, where he says, I will do this to you. I'm going to come, and I'm going to take care of you. And in that new covenant, you know who you're going to get? You're going to get the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, that spirit of truth is going to come, and he's going to work in you. And you know what happens in John 13, 14, 15, 16, in the upper room, when he's talking about that new covenant ministry they're going to have out there in the kingdom, out there in the ages to come? They begin to see how the Holy Ghost is going to work in their midst. Come on, just, just look, look over there at chapter 14. It's not on your list, but you're looking at me like I'm a fool shot out of a cannon. So look at chapter 14. Because you have to, but see, folks, what happens is, is we get caught up in this, oh, John's such a love. And John's a beautiful book of, of God's care and love for those that believe. But who are the believe? Who is he talking to? The believing remnant, see? Because he's got to have, if the believing remnant is right and they're in their place, then the Gentiles will get the message out there in the future. Look at John 14. 
Look down at verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Now, I've got, you need to highlight, box out that word another. Because who's the first comforter? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to get another one. We're going to get another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and, now watch, shall be in you. That is not a present tense. That is a future tense. When the future out over here comes, what's going to happen? You're going to get the Holy Spirit. When do they get the Holy Spirit? Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. That's a historical record of it. Now, drop down to verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So what's the work product here of the Holy Ghost, the first issue? He's going to cause them to live in the Gospels. He's going to cause them to remember all that the Lord said and did. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's going to, t the, by the way, the work product of the Holy Ghost is the written Word of God, okay? If you hang with me, in about four weeks, we'll talk about the Godhead, or well, maybe a little longer than four weeks, but we'll talk about the Godhead, and they're living for one another, and the work product. By the way, do you know what the work product of our Savior is? I just told you. Our Savior, Calvary. See. What's going to happen? The Holy Ghost is going to come in, and he's going to remind them, here's the Gospels. Now, look over at chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, and that shall he speak. Now watch. And he will show you, what? Things to come. You need to write down there Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 5, because the writer of Hebrews says, we're talking about things to come. So now what is the Holy Spirit going to do? Not only is he going to remind them of what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they're going to have the books in front of them, he's now going to go and work in that little flock, and he's going to cause the Hebrew epistles to be written and accomplished and done. So that by the time that the Apostle Paul shows up, if you think about it historically, all of those books are done, except for 2 Peter and maybe, you know, a couple little things here and there. All right? What are they? I'm going to give you the power to become. They're getting the Holy Spirit. They're getting that issue of in the upper room, the Lord was going to talk to them about the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit's going to work in their midst in the new covenant, and how they're going to do it. Now, real quick, come with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Because this helps with Matthew 10. All right? Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew 10, you have the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 10, Matthew 28 is not the Great Commission, sorry. Matthew 10 is the Great Commission. The reason is, is it starts in the moment where he picks the 12 apostles, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and then he commissions them, verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The spiritual lost, that's who we're after, of Israel. So they go, that's where they work. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let your eye draw across the page to verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Isn't that interesting? This commission from verse 5 to, is going to cover the moment in time all the way to the second coming. Not just a moment in time. It's the whole of it. So you dive back up in verse 19. But when they deliver you up, well, watch, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. 
For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. That's Acts 1 to 8. So when old Pete stands up in Acts 2 and says, Men and brethren, hark, Israel, hearken, 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 he's not over here and studied three hours before. He's just letting her fly. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is letting it fly. Now come back to John, because I got way off. John 20. So when you think about what's happening in John, by the way, you don't read any of this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Actually, the upper room in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is like a chapter, half a chapter, chapter and a half. You know, it's really t John 13, 14, 15, four whole chapters in one evening. 17, John 17 is the true Lord's Prayer where he's praying to the Father. They're going out into the garden. What happens next in John? Uh, uh, betrayed. Trial. Beat. Cal crucified, resurrected. It's fantastically how, boom, here it is. Now look at John 20 and look at verse 30 because here's really the crux of it. John 20, verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. Okay? Now, you got 20, chapter 21, look at verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Now go back to verse 30. In the Gospel of John, and why it, John gives everybody, all the Bible dudes, a headache is because there's only eight signs, eight miracles in the book. Think about that. There's only eight of them. In Matthew, there are 20. In Mark, there are 18. In Luke, there are 20. And in John, there's only eight. <laughs> that cracks me up. So what do they do? They try to take eight and make it out into 20. Or they leave the eight where they go and they do all this stuff. And then they say, well, but, you know, John is just kind of an oddball. So really we need the gospel. And they invent and they do wisdom of word dance and try to figure out. John says no. Because look at 20 verse 31. Why are they only eight? Now, if, he, if all of them had been written down, the world would have been full of the books. He does much more than the eight. He does 20, 18, 20, okay? But look at verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life, watch, through his what? Not his blood, not his cross, his what? His name. So, by the way, little little cul-de-sac move here for you. You take John 3.16. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks in the first with 1 Corinthians. We all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What does 20 verse 31 say they are to believe about him? That who is he? He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. And what are you going to be believing him in him about? His name. Nothing about Calvary. Nothing about the shed blood of the world or Jesus Christ. None of that. Well, so when you come into John, you've got to be pretty careful here, okay? Come back to chapter 2. So you think about this issue. There's only eight of them. We'll get back on track so I finish by noon, okay? And don't get yelled at. You think about there's only eight miracles. Seven are pre-cross. One is after the cross. The cross is not a miracle. I know it's a miracle, but it's not a miracle to in, in, in the book of John to demonstrate that he is the Son of God. It does do that, but it's not, it's, list, it's separate. Look at 2.11, just real quick. 2.11, this beginning of miracles, 
did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. You see that this beginning of miracles? Look at chapter 4, verse 54. 454. This again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea in the Galilee. You see that first miracle, second miracle? Okay, that, that's, how you, that's kind of the pattern that's going to happen. Now, in chapter 2 of John, here's his first miracle. And it's the water to wine of Cana, uh, the marriage at Cana there, chapter one through, uh, ver, uh, 1 through 12. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. And the Lord is going to turn water to wine. Now, the first miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ is a dispensational miracle. The first one that Peter does in Acts is dispensational in nature. Paul's first miracle in Acts 13 is dispensational in nature. In Acts 13, Paul, you have the blinding of the Jew, and you have the Gentile coming to the light in the centurion and Elamea and so forth. Peter, you have him heal the, the, the lame outside of the temple. Here's the nation of Israel who's, who's lame spiritually. He, by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, boom, I don't got money. Or By the way, I don't have any money. I have no gold or silver. Why? Because Matthew 10 said, don't worry about that. You'll be taken care of. So he's not worried about it. He goes, I don't have it, but I do have the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So you got a picture of him dispensationally doing what with Israel? Fixing her uh, her lameness, and bringing her into the temple of God. Okay? It's dispensational. Why? Because the kingdom is what? At hand. It's time. Okay? The Lord's miracle here. It's the water to wine. Look, just, and we're just going to read it here real quickly, and then I'll lay out the rest of them for you as you have them in the list there, and you can look at them. But if you just look here at verse 3. When they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, I love that, woman. I, it's not disrespectful, by the way. It's identifying her as who she is, Israel. What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now, now that's a key one with the Roman Catholics, by the way. And there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews contain, uh, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water and fill them up to the brim. Okay? And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants withdrew the water knew. And the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Now watch, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So what in the world is he talking about? Well, first he looks at mom and says, Woman, you don't know, my hour is not come. It's not time for him to be manifested as king of the Jews, king of Israel. It's not time yet. So what are we going to do? There, there's a Debbie Downer in the room right now. There's no wine. We're, we're having a party. we got a marriage going on. There's no wine. There's sorrow. But when the king shows up, what's he bringing? The kingdom. And what's in the kingdom? The blessings filled to the brim. See that in that verse? Brim. Filled it up. Where does Israel's blessings lie? They lie when the king returns and establishes the kingdom on the earth, as he did, as he promised, and here he's doing it. So the dispensational, the miracle here is his kingdom reign and restoring of joy and kindness and blessing to Israel. You see, there's more going on here than him just going abracadabra, zoom, bang, boom, bam, and it's done. There's significance here, filling it to the brim. By the way, in verse 9, the ruler of the feast, he knew not whence it was. The leadership of Israel has no clue what he's doing. But then look at the parenthesis. But the servants which drew the water knew. Who are that? That's the little flock. That's that servant issue. 
So that first miracle, the water, the wine, power to turn sadness to gladness for the nation through his kingdom reign. The next miracle is in chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. And that's the healing of the nobleman's son. And that's the issue there, again, for him to... The power to transform the the diseased nation to a healthy nation. From polluted and corrupt to pure and righteous. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 9, you have the impotent man. He just speaks a word. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't lay any hand. He just speaks the word. And boom, there he was. It's done. He takes the, the paralyzing issues and he turns it into energy. Chapter 6, the first 14 verses, you have the feeding of the 5,000. And that demonstrates his power to feed the hungry and to fill them to overflowing benefit and blessings and power. Why? He's God. He's the Son of God. That's who he is. Number next is number four, right? One, two, three, four. Number five is in chapter 6, verse 15 to 21, and he walks on the water. Woo! That demonstrates that he is God creator. He has the power to turn the turmoil of the moment to tranquility. He also has control over creation. Man should have. I love it. He asked Job, Job, how you doing with the donkey? How you doing with that kid? He running him or is he running you? Well, usually it's he runs you. And he goes, no, man was set to have dominion over the animal. And you're in your life. He doesn't. He can come in and boom, there he is. Then chapter 9. The first 13 verses, you have the blind man, where you have the power, where he's demonstrating the power to turn darkness to light. Then in chapter 11, verse 1, you have Lazarus. And that's that issue of resurrection life and the power over the grave, power over the death enemy. Because what's going to happen to him on the third day? What's he going to do? He's going to rise up. You come over there to, I I tell you, you come over to chapter 20. Chapter 20. You see chapter 20? You see verse 6? Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes. That's only found in John, by the way. But wrapped together in a place by itself. You know what that's demonstrating? As God, what did he do? They got him in the grave clothes. They got him wrapped in his head, a napkin. He literally, napkin, it's my handkerchief, it's clean. He literally does what? Comes up out of those clothes, leaving them perfect where they lay. You know what that demonstrates? Only God can do that. What did Lazarus do when he came out? He came out hopping. What did the Lord say? Unloose him. Cut him loose. He come out hopping like a, like a bunny rabbit. He said, no. What does the Lord do? He just comes right up out of the grave doesn't mess them, doesn't disturb them. The body's here and the head there, and it's sitting right there. Only John gives you such great detail about that. Why? Because he's God. He's the Son of God. And then the last miracle is in chapter 21, and it's after the resurrection. And it's in verse 6 through 11. And it's the casting the nets over the side. And that's the ultimate issue of the resurrection brings in that power to turn frustration into success and triumph. And what all of these do, these eight do, is they demonstrate the power of in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That transforming power, the Word, He just speaks the Word. And He has that power 
Because of who he is, God. That's who he is. And in, so you begin to see that. So then in John, what you begin to see is him also now say that I am Jehovah. Not only am I God the Son, the, God told uh, the, the, the Son, the Lord talks to Moses. He says, Moses, they've known me by creation. They've known me as God Almighty. They need to know me by Jehovah now. So we're going to do a little testing in the wilderness, five tests out there to prove that I am going to provide for you. So you have seven I am's. I didn't list them that are going to match up with the, the eight miracles, which are then going to match up with the seven feast schedules. We're going to look at all of that next time. Just so you see, look at 15.1. And I didn't list this because the paper was go on the back. And Look at 15.1. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. And my father is the husband. You see that true vine? In Israel's tree history, there's four trees that represent the history of Israel. The vine tree is the national life of Israel. The fig tree is the religious life. That's why he curses the fig tree and it withers on the, and so forth. By the way, most of Christianity flipped those two. And the reason they flip them is so that they can say the church, the body of Christ, is replacement Israel because he curses the, the fig tree. And then over here, the fig tree buds. But what they miss in the budding of the fig tree is the activity of the satanic policy of evil and the use of the Antichrist who's going to come in and resurrect the old covenant. See, they miss all of that. And they say, see, he cursed the fig tree, it withered, and here's the church, the body of Christ, and they replace. And it's like... Say, what? <laughs> and off you go. What I want you to see, though, is he says, I am the what kind of vine? I'm the true one. Come over to chapter 14. Chapter 14. And verse 6, a verse we know. Chapter 14, verse 6. What does he say? I, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's what? He's the way. Chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Chapter 6. He just fed the 5,000. Chapter 6 and verse 35. Chapter 6, verse 30. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Isn't that interesting? We'll look into those because they're going to match a Jehovah title, a Jehovah name. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapheka, Jehovah, and off you go and go and go so much I had to write them down in the front of my Bible. And I'll get, we'll do that next time, next week. What, John, what's the purpose of John? He came into his own, his own received him not, but those that do receive him. So there are some, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What are they believing? Not the death, burial, and resurrection. They're believing what? His name. By the way, John 20, verse number 9, they had just gone up to the gravesite. They didn't understand at all that he had said he was going to be risen. That's why the angels look at him and say, why are you looking for the dead amongst the... Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? If they'd have believed him, they wouldn't have been there. But they don't. They got a little, they're a little nervous. Then he, Luke 24, he opens their understanding. Follow? John's a great book. Don't skip it just because we protest and get in it. Learn. Because what, it pictures everything. Shows it all. It's a wonderful book. And it's a book that you have to be careful with, but yet at the same time, just love it and enjoy it. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for a book like John that we can get into it and see 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we can rest in that and we can enjoy it and we can love it and we can live in it and we can enjoy our identity in that that we learn in Romans 6, 7, and 8. In your name we pray. Amen.